Hello, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Stephanie. I'm the chair of the Personal Growth Forum and your moderator for this evening. We also welcome our listening audience, and we invite everyone to visit us online at commonwealthclub.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. Tonight we are honored to have with us philosopher, professor, and author, Dr. Nico Dr. Jacob Needleman, yeah. <laughs> who is here to discuss spirituality and wisdom. Dr. Needleman has studied at Harvard, Yale, and the University of Freiburg in Germany, and has spoken and written about these topics for more than 50 years, including his newest book, Necessary Wisdom. Tonight's discussion will cover a diverse range of subjects, including making sense of mysticism, the secrets of time and love, the meaning of money, and of course, the great questions of life. We're glad you are here and welcome you to submit your questions for Dr. Needleman using the question cards on your seat, as Eric said. There are four members in the aisles who will collect your cards. Please note that due to the size of the audience, we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible in the allotted time for the program. And to close the event, Dr. Needleman will be treating us to a guided meditation so once I hit the three gavels to end the event, please don't leave because that's when we're going to do our meditation together as a group, okay? Wonderful. So with that said, hello, Dr. Needleman, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Well, to be here. Wonderful. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. In your book, Necessary Wisdom, you mention that philosophy is intrinsically concerned with the search for wisdom. And wisdom means the ability to understand our place in the universe and live in accordance with that understanding. Would you please tell us more about this? <laughs> I think, first of all, <clears throat> one, I'd like to say one thing before, maybe that will help, about philosophy, as I understand it. Um, there are <clears throat> questions that every human being sooner or later asks very, very deeply, very strongly. Uh, questions that are come from a very deep part of our nature, of our, of our being. Uh, questions which science cannot answer. And it, knows it cannot answer, if it's honest. These are questions of the heart, I would call them. And they come from a part of the human being that is not yet recognized or honored very much by our science, our psychology, our contemporary worldview. Mm -hmm. Questions like the existence of God, uh, what happens after death, questions about why is there evil, uh, how why do we suffer, questions about how we ought to live, what we ought to do. These are, what can we know? Who am I? In the deep sense of the question, you know. These are questions that come from a, a part of the human soul, the human psyche, which is not, as I said, recognized or honored, but they're the essential part of ourselves. And they're the questions that it's one way or the other, at one point or another in a person's life or old age or whatever, they're going to be deeply asking questions like, what's it all about? What's it all for? Why? Why? Why is there evil? Why is there... That philosophy is the art of living with those questions and pondering them and trying to wrestle with them and and think about them together. So if we see that philosophy comes from a deep, deeply real part of ourselves, which really is more important, more essential to what we are than our biological or social nature, really. If this is the transcendent part of the human being that defines us as a human being. The question that you've just cited, the, the, the notion of wisdom, has to do with that part. And the nature, question of the, the real nature of reality, you can call it the universe if you want. 
That is one of those questions. All the thousand facts, billions of facts in the world don't add up to the reason for existence. Don't add up to why, how, what are we for, what ought we to do, how to love, how to be fully human. So that we could go on for the next rest of our life with just that one question, but we have not that much time together, okay. I think. Thank you. We all know people who spend their lives embittered and grouchy. It's easy to tell them and ourselves to cheer up, yet the world is full of disappointments and trouble, and it seems it always is. Assuming we don't have a real medical problem such as depression, what does philosophy as a spiritual quest have to offer us? After all, what is spirituality, really? What is what? Spirituality, yeah, really. Well, that's... We'll come to that, of course, and we're right now. <laughs> so stay in your chair. <laughs> um, I think that's a great question. And w years and years ago, when I first started teaching philosophy at San Francisco State, which is a wonderfully diverse, full of lively, too lively sometimes, students and uh, young people, men and women, uh, I was teaching a one particular philosopher who was a beautiful writer, a very deep writer, which we were studying. And I was a little concerned that the students who wouldn't be able to relate to this kind of complicated thought about ultimate questions and so forth, beautiful with, I was worried that they wouldn't, it was, it was years and years ago. And at the end of the class, I asked the students, so, <clears throat> how would you think of this course? And they, it was wonderful, it was great. And I said, oh, what was it that you liked about it? And one, they said different things, but one student said, it brought me hope. That's what you're asking about. What kind of hope? Because philosophy, as we were studying, did not talk about improving society. It did not talk about getting mastery of things or getting wealth or getting safe or secure. Uh, so I, I, I went into it and I realized what, then all the students agreed. They were, yes, it brought hope. Because the world is going to hell as it always is. And they, they said, well, it brought hope. And the, the hope it brought was that studying that philosophy in the way I've just defined it, and not philosophy as a a very interesting, but not as a technical study, but as a deep confrontation with the questions of the heart. Studying philosophy like that, if it's taught in the right way, brings you in touch with this part of yourself that our, our culture does not acknowledge, does not honor, does not recognize. That part that is a touch of transcendence and yearning and love, called the love of wisdom, but those words have become very cliche. But this yearning that we're born with, that part, when, it, when we come in touch with that, it brings a kind of hope, not a hope of future events, but a hope of being an, another kind of human being. Being a fully human being. And when you think of what, hope, that's a real kind of hope, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say to the grouch. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. What is the difference, if any, between what is called enlightenment and simply feeling content and happy with one's position in life? <clears throat> In the history of humanity, in the great history of the great religious and philosophically serious teachings of the world, there is a notion, and it's expressed sometimes in symbol symbolic and in mythic terms, but in sometimes in more uh, scientific terms, as it were, of levels of understanding, levels of knowing, uh, a higher level of knowing which is the result of the activation, 
of the activation of a part of the human mind that is in ordinary life inaudible. We can't hear it. There's a, there's an, a quality of the human mind which we are not in touch with except very rarely under extreme conditions sometimes, or jo great joy or great sorrow. We come in touch with a part of the mind that is like, sees things as they are. We know it. We know things that we don't know just by thinking it analytically and looking with our senses. That we know and we've all had moments like that. We haven't called them enlightenment. But we have all had moments when we were more fully present and where we understand and saw things as they are with, with absolute certainty. Then we lose it, we forget about it, and we go. But the activation of that is one thing for a moment. But when you can live with more of that, more moments like that, so that it begins drop by drop, little by little, to guide your life a little more, to actually guide your movement and your actions and your words, that's the beginning of enlightenment, and it has nothing it's very, very different than our ordinary, everyday kind of knowing. It really, that it's a part of the psyche, a part of the mind that can know things as they are, really, whereas mostly we know things only as we project our thoughts upon them. Is that, is that clear? You may, not, you may not agree with what it is, but it's just the idea, clear, has to be clear. I, th I think that um, some of us might call that a God shot, maybe? God shot? Why not? <laughs> call it what you wish, as long as we're talking about the same thing. I think so. <laughs> right? Okay. Well, from a spiritual viewpoint, why can human beings feel love? Why do they work? Why can human beings feel love? You can only answer that question when you feel it. When you feel love, real love, not just automatic attractions and not just psychologically conditioned and not just a one, a, the physical attraction or the attraction of one part or one motive or another, but great real love, the love that I a great master, a teacher, a Christ, a Buddha, a, a saint, a, a highly developed human being feels real love. We have moments like that in our life with our people or even with animals. When you feel when you have that, you know why. It's, it's what we are. It, in, with the great philosophical, spiritual vision of what is human being says that our modern view says that generally tends to say that man is just a complicated animal with a computer on the top of his neck and uh, that we are just developed that way and underneath it we're just a raging, egoistic, animalistic. The great spiritual traditions which are based on different kind of knowledge tell us that we are born essentially compassionate and loving. We are born with love. Underneath it Underneath all the moralism, underneath the puritanism, underneath the social conditioning, we have a radiance of compassion which we've lost contact with. But the moment we, the moment we come in touch with that, even for a moment, we see why. Well, and that'll bring us to the next, the next question, or the one after the next question, <laughs> which is the, the question of what is the meaning of life, which is such a fundamental question that everybody, people nowadays, well, they stop. It used to be you would laugh at that question. Because it would remind me to come to that when you ask me about that question. Well, I have that one near the end. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to that one. Um, okay, so a lot of New Age philosophies say that true unconditional giving is repaid by the universe. Is this true or just wishful thinking? True, unconditional giving is, re, is repaid by the universe? I think it's true. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> but it takes, sometimes it takes time. 
and maybe it doesn't happen right away or even later on, or maybe your grandchildren get the reward, but the universe is obliged to pay you, reward you for that sort of thing, if it's genuine. It's because the universe is basically mathematical, and that's a mathematical issue. The more you give, the more you receive, but you may not, you may not get it right away. Okay. Well, we've got some audience questions I'm going to go to. We have some audience questions I'm going to go to. I'm going to try and read them here. What is your opinion of an inner voice that talks to you and guides you sometimes in the right direction? I think I got that right. If it's genuine, it's good. If it's fake, it's questionable. <laughs> How's that for a... <laughs> No, we have to go into these things, and when we come to spirituality, I would like to say a few things about the word spirituality at some point, because that's what yep. this is. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, what, what you don't, there was a time about, oh, about 40, 50 years ago, it, the word spirituality was never really used very much as it is now. It, it was connect, in connected with religious, uh, religion as we ordinarily know it. But we it came to be with the, the, the new religious movements that came into the West in the 1960s uh, and called, began to call a new age of movement, but that's a bad word, really. But these went religions and teachings from Asia that came into the culture. We, we, we have a whole new definition, a whole new aspect of religion that we had forgotten about in the West was revealed and known, which many people knew before, but most of us hadn't heard about it, that every great authentic religion has a part, has, uh, at least in its origins and its earliest histories, and sometimes it continues, especially in Asia. Uh, oh, great religions have a part of them, a big part of them, that is teachings, ideas about reality and the universe, and about what we ought to do, and uh, about social problems, et cetera, et cetera, about ritual, and doctrine, and that's one part of it. That's what you might call the, uh, the, the knowledge part, the, the, the doctrine. But there was another part that we found in the Asian religions which had to do with a, 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 a work on the inner world, a work on the mind, on the heart, on the feelings, of developing and experiencing and awakening a quality of experience and feeling which transcended uh, our everyday experience. The first part, when it's all by itself without the second part, doesn't necessarily open you to a, other levels of being and experience in your life. But the second part, which we might call the practice, that was the spirituality part, the spiritual dimension, Spirituality then came to be roughly equated with an interest in something inside myself, not so much a belief in external things or action, but a, a, sometimes a search for a, a deeper part of human nature that gives life its meaning. Then it became spiritual. That was the spiritual dimension of like med practices like meditation and various other psychological, physical practices. De disciplines like yoga in, in its original context, which helped to develop the inner world. And that became usually, I'll finish in a minute, usually that part of the teaching was kept hidden until, until people were ready for it. And they often, at least in the Western in Christianity and Judaism, they had to go through the outer part first until they found themselves ready for the inner part. And in Asia, it was more mixed, but it's still, in principle, in fact, it was still that distinction or wasn't quite as clear as in the West. What happened in the New Age period is that the, the texts and books and teachers came who were bringing the second part, the practice part, the inner part, without necessarily bringing or without compelling or demanding that people go through the first part. So spirituality became, that used to, that was often in history, something you had to work through the moral dimensions and outer parts of the teaching. Now it was just spread all over, 
began to spread because it's very appealing in a scientific age without the doctrines of dogma and religious belief that were required. That was spirituality. Now it's become spread. It's become superficial in many places. But it's become the whole idea of being interested in something higher in myself. And that people can, are touched by that. And it's that spirituality as it is now a cultural phenomenon, what is called, when most people nowadays, when they ask, their, are you religious, they will say, I am spiritual but not religious. And spiritual but not religious is one of the biggest movements and it's growing in, Amer in America. And it can be many levels. It can be something superficial and it can be very deep, but it's very very much part of our American culture now. And we need to understand what spirituality, just a little bit about the roots of that word. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so with that said, how do we know when we are truly happy <coughs> in a society that has conditioned us to be entertained, to be occupied, to be self-content? <laughs> How do we know when we're truly what? Happy. Ha Happy. Happy. <laughs> it's a queer, interesting question. Um, it's a queer question because we have thousands and thousands of moments of when we think we're happy, feel happy, and then we find ourselves going down into the dumps and get disillusioned, depressed, hurt, betrayed, puzzled, and un unhappy. So we, I think, we can come when we can come to a a point of I would say the question is man, humanity, human being, is not exactly born for what we ordinarily call happiness. I would say the fundamental motivation of a human being really is meaning. We'll talk about that. Meaning, meaning, to have a meaningful life, a me that doesn't necessarily require lots of pleasures and happiness. It can be very difficult. It can be very hard. It can be very full of sorrow. But it can be so meaningful that it brings happiness in a very different meaning, different sense. You wouldn't trade a life of great meaning for a life of just pleasure. So insofar as happiness is a kind of pleasure, it's not really, one can never be satisfied with that. It's like saying as a drug, you know, just pleasure is not meaning. Pleasure can be meaningful, but pain can be also meaningful. And when you're in that kind of a situation and you're living a life of meaning, then you, I think you know what happiness really is. I hope that's not too paradoxical sounding. Does it make sense? Okay. I should be asking you the questions. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to say that um, for our listening audience that you are listening to uh, Necessary Wisdom with Dr. Jacob Needleman at the Commonwealth Club of California. Okay, so we've got some really good questions here. And let me see. Here's a good one. Well, they're all good. What? They're all good. Ready? Can you differentiate between the soul and the spirit? Well, historically, there's a difference. The words are used sometimes in a very profound way, a very the difference is sometimes very profound. Um, and um, the spirit in 
say, in early Christian writings, the earlier Christian writings, mystics, which is a word we'll talk about in a minute, uh, made a distinction between the spirit which comes from God, which is the pure, the highest consciousness, the highest uh, force in the world, in the universe and the soul, which is an element in a, an entity, a consciousness in a human being, high, very well developed, which can be open to spirit. So the, the soul is something that usually is within the, within the human being, as it were, and can touch and open to spirit, and can be itself very strong, very powerful, very good but not necessarily the same thing as the element that comes from the highest element, the highest part, which we can call God or the Trinity or whatever, or the, the, the Hebrew God or something. Spirit is above everything and comes down into us. So the soul is, is a, something like what we were talking about at the beginning, of that part of ourselves which is yearns and then sometimes even begins to, to incarnate, as it were, higher truth, higher wisdom. Spirit is not in one is not one person. Spirit is a, a mysterious force throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. That's one way of looking at the difference. It's, it's a very big question in in the writings of the of, the, of the, some of the mystics in, in the Western tradition. In the East tradition, there's other words that we can talk about, but like in the Hindu, in India, the spirit, uh, the soul might be called the, uh, the God within, Atma, but um, that could take us in another direction. Okay, thank you. What are the three most important lessons you would want the children of the new generation to learn for a spiritually fulfilled life? <laughs> How did I get into this? <laughs> Let me um, come back to that. Huh? <laughs> Let me come back to that. You want to come back to yeah. that one? Okay. Here's, do you have any examples of bad or wrong philosophy? <laughs> oh, did we tell you it was going to be easy? <laughs> I'm just looking to see if my colleagues are in the... Uh... <laughs> well, that's a great question. I can have a lot of fun with that, but, um, you know... Logical positivism, communism, uh, that's two out of three. Let's see. Um, yes, so there's the philosophies uh, of. where people views spiritual or religious teaching, serious religious ideas for egoistic purposes. Um, and a lot of the dangerous, violent philosophies of the world are, make, are using great ideas for egoistic purposes, which involve violence and, and domination and injustice and um, something really, one of its very extreme, like Nazi philosophy and things of that kind of thing. But there are great ideas that have come to mankind through philosophy, through great thinkers. Maybe they're not all equal, but there are some very great teachings that have come to our, into our world 
since ancient times. <clears throat> and when certain kinds of ideas are very powerful, and when they're not supported by a lot of, by a community of thinking, by, by people, friends, or comrades, by, or by a, a genuine mentor or a teacher who can help, those ideas all by themselves can become really poison and cause a great deal of harm to mankind. And, uh, for example, the idea of a higher human being, a more developed human being, and spiritual, but we, that word is sometimes not used, and it, it was, it's been translated, that idea has been translated as the idea of the Ebermensch, the superman, the higher man. It's an example of a very powerful idea which has a deep amount of truth to it when, when you really understand all the other ideas that have to go with it. But when you take it just by itself and just use it as your own uneducated mind and feelings want to use it, it becomes uh, tyrannical and dangerous and hurtful. Mm. So that's where we must look for good and bad philosophy, I think, in something like be learning how to exp experience and to value great ideas without immediately appropriating them for your own personal uh, egoistic advantage. That takes, and that takes help sometimes from a teacher who can point that out to you. Mm. Is there any philosophical basis to the law of attraction which says that by focusing on positive or negative thoughts, one can bring about positive or negative results? If you could really focus the entire part of your psyche, which means not just here, but here and other places, uh, if you could focus all your psychic energy, which is completely fills your body, you don't even know it, if you could focus that attention on something like that, you could probably, as they say, move mountains. But we live in such a small part of our psyche. We don't have any idea what we're not in touch with. And sometimes, I think sometimes just focusing on something can have interesting results, but on the whole, I don't think of it as a reliable, uh, a reliable, without, there's a great saying um, that I always like, it, that I think is relevant. <clears throat> it's from the Islamic tradition, which is a great tradition in, in its authenticity. Trust in Allah, but tie your camel first. <laughs> So you can try to do that, but meanwhile, uh, pay your taxes and do the other thing. Get the thing done. You're, the, you're, you're in the real world. Okay. Well, okay, so since wisdom comes from life experiences, with older individuals at an advantage, how do you... Uh, inculcate... Thank you. The necessary wisdom to the youth who really need it. I, that might tie into our other question. Well, that's one of the, that is one of the things I really am trying to do with my own life, is to try to take younger people, in this, very often at college and in, in the university, uh, and expose them to really great ideas that bring them the hope of that hope that comes with contacting the real human nature within you. And uh, because, in my opinion, <clears throat> there are a lot of toxic ideas that are circulating in the culture what, uh, as to what is real, what, what's, what counts as an explanation, a kind of reduction of, of everything gen greatly human, everything purposeful of nature in its glory and its wonder, reducing it to pure, mindless, mechanistic processes. And that, I think, is it depresses the human spirit. And, uh, and 
that has to be, that I think needs to be, there has to be something else where younger people can realize there, there is something greater. It doesn't mean inculcating, it doesn't mean inculcating into dogmas or religious dogmas or anything like that, but just opening the whole mind, the heart of the mind as well as the intellectual powers. Because the mind has a heart that really can see things that the everyday intellect can't see. So my, my aim is myself and as a teacher has been to be, do justice to the academic di distinctions and, and necessities, but at the same time honoring and helping to develop the heart of the mind with great ideas that bring you that hope. And so maybe we should go back to that former question. What are the three most important lessons you would want the children of the new generation to learn for a spiritually fulfilled life? Well, I would say, first of all, one of them, which is not my idea, but from a very wise man who said, it's necessary for children, for a child to love, honor his parents uh, because the parents, he's put it in a certain way, he said parents have, be, have to be like God to the child, even if they're bad people. They're, but the parents need to be like God. There needs to be a place in the mind this man said, so that when the parents die and the child and the man person is on their own, then God can find the place in the, in the mind of the human being. In other words, critic parents need to occupy a place that later God can occupy. Isn't that that's interesting? Yes. So that's the first, second, and third maybe thing. <laughs> but let's go on to the fourth maybe I, I think uh, again looking at my own I think um, uh, I think something about I can't be sure about how to put this but about not believing you can get something for nothing. That everything has to be earned and worked for for an honorable life. Um, except for maybe the grace of God. Everything needs to be earned and worked for. I think something in that direction I think is needed for young, for young people. And uh, so let's say I, I got two of the things, and we can go, maybe we'll find others, but it's a great question. That's one that concerns me more and more, how much younger people, not just college people, but really young mm -hmm. people, I want, I want to be able to present philosophy in the sense we're talking about it mm -hmm. to 10-year-olds, 9-year-olds, Eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. I think something in, in the child has an inherent love of great of the of, of the universe. So, mm -hmm. so that that's been my main concern in the past ten, twenty years. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of parents are teaching their children yoga and meditation at an earlier and earlier age. And I think that would be one of them as well. Would you agree? It would have to be, we'd have to see what kind of meditation, what, what that means, what kind of yoga. There are, it's, it, it's, there's lots of things now going on, of different quality, and everything has its nature. And, of course, a parent, uh, parents can, with teaching their child uh, manners but doing it with such love and such love, firmness that's rooted in love. Teaching their child or letting their, helping their child learn music with, done with such sensitivity and 
openness to what music really means can do a lot more than yoga being taught by just some somebody who has a kind of a fixed idea of what should, what things should be. Mm -hmm. It's it's not so much what for the child. It's not so much what you teach. It's what you are when you teach. I think mm. that's important. Yes. Thank you. Isn't that so? Uh, so does everything happen for a reason? What is your perspective on fate? Good audience, huh? <laughs> I remember going over to, uh, with a dear friend who was a mentor of mine, <coughs> and we went to Thailand, and we were going over a Buddhist text together. And um, it was a, a, one of the people, who, the person we were working with was a, a professor, a scholar named John Blofeld. And, uh, I remember he, we were getting up after a day of working a translation of a Tibetan text. And he was a very big scholar of Buddhism, John Blofeld. And my friend was a very wise man. And we were going out for dinner. And Mr. Blofeld couldn't find his keys to the car. And he said they were lost, his keys. He couldn't find them. He said, well, that was, that's karma, fate. <laughs> and um, my friend said, no, that's not karma. <laughs> you, you just uh, you forgot where you put them. <laughs> and so we, we uh, let, that's where it stayed. They, we had a nice, friendly discussion. Pardon me. Then a year or two later, a very, very wise man came to visit in America who was the head of the Nyingma part of it, a great Tibetan teacher who was one of the top people. And um, we, my friend who had been in Thailand with, we went to hear him. And my friend asked this great, really very wise, very highly developed Tibetan lama, his about John Blofeld losing his keys. He said, tell me, uh, Rinpoche, which is the name for teacher, Lama, tell me, Rinpoche, was that karma? And he said, no, it was an accident. <laughs> so that there's a difference between something which is deeply current into you, the current of your nature, that your inner nature attracts but insofar as we live in our superficial side, we don't get that attraction. The, the superficial side of us, which is called, we call our real nature, which is often just an ego, that doesn't, that blocks, sometimes blocks, the attractions of the inner nature that would allow fate to act on you. It's a hell of a good question. Mm -hmm. How are animals or pets spiritually connected to us? You're asking someone who is uh, a pupil of two very highly developed cats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I'm not going to get into trouble. But. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Does having money make it easier or harder to be spiritual? Does being spiritual make it easier or harder to amass money? <laughs> well, I did uh, think of getting a sweatshirt, it was, you know, that we had philosophy in front. And on the back said, I'm in it for the money. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but it's a good question. Good question. Because 
what is the role of money in our life? And uh, that uh, it, it, money can be a great help in, if it's used for the search for truth. Mm. And, but it can also be a great distraction and uh, illusion if one is lost in it. So it's very important to take money seriously, but how not to be taken by it. And that's something I think most of us have to struggle with all our lives. If money is there beside us, haunting our life all the way. And mm -hmm. how to study ourselves in money, with money. Because by studying uh, how we are with money, we can become a little, sometimes, not much, but sometimes a little freer from the illusion part of it. The illusory part of it, which destroy, can destroy our life, really. So um, it's a great, it's a, it's a question of, that money has to be taken seriously, not just in order to get rich, but in order to know yourself. And that's, that needs, is not being done so much with money. Money is considered separate. It's, you do it, you're, then you become spiritual over here. But I think if I put it very seriously, and I, I wrote a book about this, with mon the man, human being is basically this is very simplified, but basically two parts of us. One is spiritual and search for meaning, and the other is material, and necessarily so, to live in the physical material world. And those two have to have their proper places. And in every culture, every civilization, the second part, the, the material part, the part of the worldly part, is important, is developed, and money is the, is the element in our current culture that organizes that material part of our nature. And it's not spiritual, but the, but the spiritual quest is to live with those two parts harmoniously in relation to each other. And so that's why money needs to be taken seriously as representing one ha almost one half of human nature, but the spiritual part has to become is distinct, but it needs to be balanced with the other one, both together. But it's it's not the primary thing. Money is not spiritual, but the, the, the search for the place of money is spiritual. Is part of question of human, to study myself as being a, a being of two parts, one on the earth, one on heaven, how heaven and earth can exist in us, that defines a human being. We're meant to have these two worlds, and money is important in how we organize one of those parts. So there's a long, it's a big question, and uh, uh, it requires a lot of thought. Not no no see no it's no no cliches like the money is no good or money is everything. I mean, neither one is right. Mm -hmm. Well, and since that was uh, what one of the chapters of your book, Necessary Wisdom, was about, um, I'd like to ask you now: What is necessary wisdom? It's a it's a title that an editor gave to my book. <laughs> That's all. That's it. Okay. <laughs> That's all, folks. Okay. So, how can we best help one another spiritually? <sighs> By, you think I can't answer that, don't you? <laughs> I'm but not trying to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is a there is a way. By learning what it means to listen to another person, mm -hmm. and it's not so simple, but uh, that's the answer. Because re real listening is the beginning of love, and it's not as hard as love. It's in fact very possible, um, but people don't realize how important listening is as the, at the be as the beginning of people helping each other to develop spiritually. Because just the fact of being listened to feeds something. 
And we all know that when, we, when we're in the midst of it, when, we, when it's directed to us, we know it. We just don't know what to call it. And we know that when we open to really listening and letting another person in and listening to them, that we also come into ourselves more. So I would call it, say, the art of, of listening, that would be the beginning, mm. helping each other. So now I'm going to wrap it around to a question that came up that you actually you asked, you asked at the beginning of the program. People are always asking themselves questions like, why am I here and what is the meaning of life? How can we recognize answers to these questions? Are we able to manifest the answers through spiritual practice? Um, we have maybe met in our lives. I have, certainly. And we can, we know from what we know of human history, men and women who gave and gave and gave. And, and we will, we sort of, of different kinds. It doesn't always be having to do with religion or this or that, but just people gave, continually giving. And we sense, I think, in those people that they found the meaning of life for themselves. And I think, I think that mankind, human being, was built to give, not to get. Uh, we only get, and we're given by all kinds of things above and around, much. But we're given much in order to give much. I don't think we ever feel really fulfilled or meaningful until we're giving and serving something higher, really higher than ourselves. So. I would say we, this, this whole idea of human being as meant to give, we're on earth in order to give something, maybe to others, maybe to the earth, maybe to nature, maybe to some group, something. That's where I would, I would take that question in that direction. Mm. And so there's, there's an experience that we sometimes have of something that is pure meaning. We know this is it. It's not because it's something else, or it, it's not for some purpose or other. It's by itself, it's meaning. There's experiences of love, experiences of, of sorrow, experiences of self, of, of giving, which by themselves, they don't have to say it's for a good cause or anything. It is meaning all by itself. It doesn't have a meaning, it is meaning. Now, that's a very mysterious saying, but it's a good, it's a mysterious question. What, did, what does, what is the meaning? What are we, we're born for meaning, but what is that? I think, it, I think it's possible uh, to experience something, with, and when you do experience it, you know this is what it's all about. That's all I can say. Mm. No. If, yeah, go ahead. If you have a message we all can take home with us, what is it? I think one of the, when I'm asked sometimes, what should we do after having conversations like this? Mm -hmm. And I think one possible response to a, that question would be to try to find what I call philosophical friends. That is, other people, other person who you meet with or speak with mainly as a colleague in the search for truth of some kind, where you can come together 
speak about questions like this with each other. Have that as one of your main motivations. A couple of friends like that would make a big difference if we tried to listen to each other and speak to each other. And it, my opinion, which may sound superstitious, is that if you do find philosophical friends that begin to speak together time to time, you will attract some kind of help. That's what I, a message that I might offer. I like that. And we have time for one more question. So it seems that lately there has been a lot of awareness generated around the health benefits and importance of having a regular spiritual practice, such as meditation. Yet many of us find this idea to be overwhelming and don't know how to start. Would you please shed some light on the topic of meditation for us? I, I feel very, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just before, I guess before he answers that question, we're going to go ahead and end the program now. We'd like to thank all of you for being here and thank Dr. Needleman for being here to discuss spirituality and wisdom with us tonight. We do appreciate all of the questions that you sent up here, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to them all. But um, again, thank you, Dr. Needleman, for being here. Thank you to our listening audience. And with that, We'll close this, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. <laughs>